Hey family, how are you? This is John Cruz, Mr. Phil and Derek's here. Welcome to our restaurant. Welcome to A1 Hip Hop. My name is John Cruz. This is Phil and Derrick's. Hi, this is John Cruz with Phil and Derrick's. Um, my wife and I purchased the restaurant about uh, four years ago. Uh, we didn't have very much restaurant experience at the time. We were just small business owners. Uh, looking to diversify our business holdings. Uh, we got into the business and it has been one huge lesson for us in that process. Uh, we've enjoyed every minute of being in the business, but it has definitely been a learning experience. And uh, uh, right now we do uh, live music, we do Cajun food, uh, we do live DJs that are here at the restaurant. Uh, and, and you know, even surviving through COVID has been uh, has been a challenge on top of just being in the restaurant business. Um, we've been bringing uh, what we do to Houston now for 10 years. The business has been around for 10 years. And uh, our wife and I, my wife and I have owned the place uh, since 2016. And uh, we're looking forward to the next 10 years. We're looking to continue to provide a great experience. Uh, and, and we like to refer to it as a black experience. It's our type of food, it's our type of music. Uh, and, and we invite all of those who enjoy black culture to come and have uh, the very best of what black culture has to offer right here at Phil and Derrick's. The, uh, uh, the look of the place uh, is, is inspired twofold. Uh, one half of the restaurant was inspired by Phil, who was the, uh, one of the original owners of Phil and Derrick's. Um, then my wife decided that we needed to add a second room and that's the room that we're sitting in right now. This is sort of our uh, dark, cozy, sexy lounge and, uh, and she decided that, that we should have a different uh, dynamic you know, in the lounge than versus the restaurant. Um, she wanted to have you know, some of uh, 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 you know, jazz artists uh, to be put on the, on the walls she wanted the uh, picture frame uh, built-ins around that. Uh, she has a lovely wine wall. I have to give her all the credit because this really was her inspiration. Uh, and and it, it turned out to be very, very nice. A lot of people uh, that come to the restaurant, half the people that come here want to only sit in the lounge. So it's, 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 it makes her feel good that people can appreciate you know, uh, you know, her creativity. Uh, anybody that's looking to get into the restaurant business, I would say uh, the best advice that I could give them is to learn the business yourself. You have to work in this business. You have to, you have to spend time uh, understanding what's going on behind the bar, what's going on in the kitchen. Um, and, and I have to say that the first couple of years that my wife and I ran and operated the business, um, we paid a huge price for not having that education and that training. Uh, the blessing is is that we are fast learners and and we were able to get in and start understanding our business from the inside out and uh, we were able to uh, change a situation where we were not seeing profitability every single month to now the business is profitable every month. That is a really good question, man. You know what? Uh, if, if, if I could name maybe a, a film and a scene that, that resonates with me, um, the, the movie, I think it's called Life with Martin Lawrence and with uh, um, uh, Eddie Murphy. There's a scene in there where he's, uh, where Eddie Murphy is in prison and he is uh, dreaming of a place that he wants to open called Ray's Boom Boom Room. 
and he's talking about every little detail of the place from the moment that you walk in the door um, the type of food and music that's being served and played he's talking about the way people are dressed and all of that and I have to say that uh, that used to be my wife and I we would sit up at night and we talked about owning a restaurant and not really thinking about how much underlying work it really took but we we had a dream of how we wanted the place to make people feel when they walked in the door the type of music that was being played the food that was being consumed uh, and and us sitting up at night dreaming you know and putting those thoughts together uh, and and then we were able to make that a reality uh, I say that that movie really demonstrated uh, not only just she and I, I think a lot of people who have a business idea, it's good to dream like that. It's good to be as detailed as you possibly can in your dream and then work like hell to bring that dream into reality. And that's one of the things that we did here with Phil and Derrick's. I mean, we sat up and we talked about everything from the art that's on the walls, the type of food that we wanted on the menu, the music that we wanted played, the type of people that we wanted to come in and partake of that experience. And then we slowly started bringing those things into fruition. And, uh, and now, you know, we, we have what we have now. My favorite dish in the morning, we had a chef that worked here at one time and uh, we had a situation where a customer came in from out of town and, and she made a reservation for, I want to say it was for uh, 10 people and then her party grew to 20 people and she really couldn't understand why we could not accommodate that larger party and uh, you know we have a very small venue here our restaurant is only 5,000 square foot uh, and we do have a patio and we've built this 1,500 square foot deck so that we can extend the experience but uh, but this young lady came in she was upset that the other her other group could not come in and share in the experience and so uh, what we did is we were able to accommodate them but we had to split them up in two parts of the restaurant and uh, and so our chef made her, you know, just to, you know, uh, uh, make her feel good. He made her a special dish, lobster and waffles. And, uh, and that's one of our uh, hallmarks. That's what we're known for. And as a brunch item and a dinner item, it's our, probably our best seller. And it's one of my personal favorites, you know. So you get, you know, either fried or grilled lobster with, you know, hot, crispy, flaky uh, Belgian waffles. And uh, that's my favorite thing to eat in the mornings. The only thing I add to it is I always have them scr soft scramble me up some eggs with it. <laughs> and that's my favorite. Uh, mm. In the evenings, uh, my favorite dish and, and probably one of our best sellers is the Bayou Catfish. And um, it's a blackened catfish with a butter sauce. And uh, it comes on top of a bed of dirty rice. And, uh, and then we top that with, uh, with fried shrimp uh, and, and uh, collard greens. And, uh, and that's uh, probably the most satisfying thing on the menu, you know, from my opinion. So listen, you know, when COVID started, um, we had 55 employees working here. And, and unfortunately, we had to cut that down to uh, three employees. We kept our GM, our chef, and the best uh, bus boy that we had on staff. We let everybody else go. That was probably the pivot whereby my wife and I had to start working in the restaurant every single day. Um, you know, and we went from doing, you know, uh, uh, almost $100,000 a week in sales to doing $2,000 a week in sales. Uh, because we were a live music uh, restaurant, we had live music four nights a week and, uh, and DJs uh, four days a week as well. Um, we were not on any of the uh, 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 food delivery platforms, so we weren't on Favor, um, uh, DoorDash, or Uber Eats. The biggest pivot that we had to do is immediately when COVID hit, we had to get on those platforms. But getting on those platforms enough, or getting on those platforms alone, was not enough to to bring revenue back into the restaurant. Um, we had just done a huge food order. The restaurant was now closed. People could not come in for dining in seating. And we had all of this food that was sitting in the kitchen that was ultimately going to spoil because we didn't know how long um, um, the doors were gonna be closed. 
I think one of the best things that we did as an organization is that we, we did a press release. Um, we notified all the media and we let them know that all the food that we had in the kitchen, we were going to get our chefs to come in, cook it all up, and just donate it to some of the families that were having the toughest time. And also the first responders, you know, the people that were you know, charged with uh, uh, showing up at folks' homes and they're ill and they don't know what these folks have and they're exposing their families to, to what could be COVID-19. Um, we had nurses um, that were working in the medical center that were, they were you know, telling us that they had been working days on end, sleeping at the hospital, hadn't seen their families, weren't eating good food. So what we did is we, we cooked up everything in our kitchen and we gave it away to the community to show support for them. And, uh, and you know, I, I think what caused us to do it was we had a gentleman that had came and he ordered some food to go. And he said that this was he and his wife's favorite restaurant. And while he was waiting on his food, he was telling me, he's like, you know, I, we got to make sure that you guys stay in business because we got to make sure that we have a place to go when COVID is over. Uh, in the meantime, he said that, but you know, if things didn't change for him, he was probably going to be out on the street because he hadn't worked. And, and, and I just thought that, man, you know, all of the restaurants are asking the community to come in and support us, but what are we doing to show support for the community? And we decided to show our support to, um, to you know, donate that food. And, um, and after, you know, um, uh, our segment made the news that we were doing it, people started donating money. We were able to raise $15,000 and we fed, you know, almost 2,000 families uh, with that money and, and was able to do, you know, a lot of good in the community. My, my views on, on what's going on right now in, in our government and in the world as it relates to black people is that none of this is anything new. Um, it's just, uh, it's being recorded and shown at a level that uh, the world has never seen before. That they can no longer cover it up. Uh, you know, what I believe spurred uh, Dr. King's movement was when on that bridge in Alabama, when the entire world saw a peaceful protest go awry at the hands of dogs, horses, and police officers. That's what really spurred um, the civil rights movement. That's what really got uh, well-intentioned white folks on board to say, hey, this is not right. And I think that's what we're seeing is a new coming of that era. Um, you have a bunch of well-intentioned people that are just saying, hey, enough is enough. I do not want to see any person brutalized to this magnitude. And, uh, and, and you know, if I speak for me and my wife, we are in full support of, of everything that's going on because we are not only black people, we're raising black children, we have black grandchildren, and we do care in how they're viewed by society and how they're treated by society. Um, we are, we, we, we uh, support and promote and, and have a business that is an ode to black culture. Um, some of the best musicians, some of the best athletes, some of the best scientists, some of the best are all black folks. And so uh, we're trying to s keep in step with that black excellence and uh, the product that we push and promote. And, uh, and, and I think that you know, we'd be remiss if we did not say that we are in support of uh, uh, black lives and we believe that black lives do matter. And, and uh, my heart is warmed when some of our white counterparts come in and, and they say that, hey, I'm making a conscious decision to do something to put a, put a stop to this injustice. I'm making a, constant, a, a, a conscious decision to spend money with black businesses. I'm making a conscious decision to uh, try to employ more black people in my particular uh, company. So I, I think right now we're seeing a renaissance of that and, and, and I'm happy uh, uh, that we are seeing that. I think the best performer that I've ever seen on stage, probably hands down, has to be Prince. And uh, I got an opportunity to see Prince perform uh, in Bossier City, Louisiana. And, uh, and uh, what struck me most is that I have to say 80 to 90% of the crowd was mostly middle-aged white women. And 
they sung every single song word for word that Prince played all night. Um, I didn't realize that, that, that he had such a dynamic impact on the white community until I got an opportunity to see him uh, in Louisiana. But I have to say that that's probably one of the best performances uh, that I've ever seen. And if I could see anybody again, it would probably be Prince. Um, as far as the best performers here, we've had some very good performers uh, that, have, that have come through. But I think Colette Duncan, uh, who performs here, matter of fact, she just performed last Saturday night. She's probably my favorite because she's, I mean, has a great, strong voice. Um, she's also very good with the crowd, so she's more than just a, a singing talent. She's really an entertainer. And, uh, and the thing I love most about Colette, um, if anybody knows me, I'm a country boy and I love cafe style music. So I love, you know, blues, Johnny Taylor, and, and, uh, uh, and she sings that type of music as well. So she's probably my favorite that performs here. And if you get an opportunity to see her on stage, we'd hope that you do so here at Phil and Derrick's. Uh, as far as last words go, you know, the thing that I would tell people, if you, if you are an entrepreneur, um, right now we're being faced with some trying times. And, uh, but I have to say that in my 25 or 30 plus years of being an entrepreneur, that my biggest growth has always come right at the time that I thought I was experiencing my biggest tragedy. Uh, um, I think that you know, our approach should not be that uh, this COVID situation is, is a tragedy that we can't overcome. I think what this, how this should be approached is that this COVID situation is opening up opportunities that we've yet to discover. What we should be busy doing is finding out what those opportunities are. Um, how can we overcome them? Even in, in my own business, you know, we've had to pivot and do different things. You know, we've had to build a patio deck um, we, we've introduced comedy nights on Friday and Saturday nights where we didn't have to do that before. But thank God all of our shows have sold out 100% every single weekend. Um, you're going to always have to make changes. You're going to always have to be nimble. Uh, my my uh, business mentor, one of the things that he used to tell me all the time, he said that rule number one for any entrepreneur is that you must overcome uh, any obstacle regardless of circumstance. That's your job as an entrepreneur, to overcome any and all obstacles, regardless of the circumstance. So if you fix your mind to that, you're gonna be more, uh, 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 you're gonna be more fixated on problem solving than just identifying problems themselves.